Hello and welcome everybody to another episode of Bearski Film. Uh, this week we're joined by a very special guest, Nick, from Just Another Year Chicago Sports. Uh, Nick's got an awesome YouTube channel where they cover, you know, all Chicago sports, Bears, Bulls, everything. And uh, I got the honor of meeting him a couple weeks ago at Rizzo Sports Bar for an event that he threw. And uh, through, very knowledgeable, good, consistent content. Nick, I don't know if you want to say yeah, nice to meet you guys. Uh, or not meet you guys. Uh, we've obviously met already, Paul. But uh, Dave, nice to meet you, and thanks for having me on the show. Uh, obviously, a very tough loss yesterday. Um, don't don't even think. I don't understand how Matt Eberflus still has a job, but here we are. So happy to be here. I'm sure we're going to talk about it today. Definitely, we've been talking about it, and it's we've kind of gotten to a point where it's like, all right, let's stop kicking this dead horse. But I mean, we go a year back and find videos, especially after the Broncos collapse where we were like, should we fire this guy mid season? And, you know, it's just unfortunate that we've had to let it get to this point for, you know, the majority of people to realize that this isn't not, this is not only not good enough, it's terrible. <laughs> so um, yeah, Dave, what are your, uh, I'm gonna let you have at it. Cause I know you, you got plenty to say. I'm sure. I mean, I just have lots of ideas. I'm, I actually am much less uh, talkative about this loss than I was last week. Cause I think last week was a little bit of that writing on the wall stuff that we have been talking about. And like, Nick, I don't know about you. I'm sure you, you with the channel, when we get things right, we have to kind of toot our own horn just to kind of be consistent about, you know, tooting our own horn and stuff. And we, we've been on the flus train for a while. Um, so none of this was like surprising, but it just was really, really, it made us very angry because it was all avoidable. And I think the writing was on the wall a long time ago for people like me and Polly who predict nine and eight seasons and, you know, are a little bit more realistic about this kind of stuff. And um, <clears throat> Polly and I have, we have literally for 10 years discussed our football philosophy and like cultivated it to what we expect and what we want out of like the bears for the future. And at this point, I think we have both hit the point where, it's championship or bust. And if you're not doing things to move towards that, then you're wasting time. And uh, this is why this year, and I said, we said this week three, I, I feel like we're just regurgitating week three. And then uh, Jacksonville and Carolina kind of fooled us. And we, we've we admitted that we got fooled really, really hard and it sucks. But this is just us rewinding to week three when the team was what it was. And um and yeah, like you can't win with this. It's just your ceiling is so low. And uh, yeah, you're not you're not doing things like a serious organization towards championship contention. This is just this is just more of the same. Just another year. Right. Like the, like your channel <laughs> says. But um, it sucks. But it is what it is. And uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm less emotional, but I'm much more. I don't know. I'm angry to the core on this one rather than being reactionary angry. Yeah, I'm with you, man. I the problem is is that we the last four years is all or the last four coaches have all been kind of experimental, right? I mean, John Fox was coming off of you know he was good in Carolina and Denver was like, eh, you know, you're you're okay, like you know you got the job done, you had good players. And then you come to Chicago, he's the only veteran head coach that we brought in since Lovey Smith. Everyone else has been a rookie. Mark Tressman, Canadian Football League, Matt Nagy, rookie coach. And then you bring in Eberflus, rookie coach as well. Some guys are just meant to be coordinators in this league, and I will pound the table for that, that Eberflus is that guy. Kind of like Vic Fangio when he went to Denver after Chicago, just didn't work out. It's just a frustrating standpoint because of the fact that Flus made a great defense, and you can see that they gave up on him. I'm sure we'll talk about that in a little bit. But no offensive progression over three years. You've had two very good quarterbacks. And people are like, oh, Justin Fields wasn't good. Look what he does over in Pittsburgh. You know, you give him a good head coach, he's winning ball games. Was he winning them pretty? No, he wasn't throwing for 300 yards, but he was getting the job done. He was doing everything that we needed. If Caleb Williams was just as fast as Justin Fields with also his scrambling ability, he would have gotten away from a lot more stuff yesterday. But this Bears team is just too good from a roster standpoint on paper to be this bad and losing games the way they're losing. Cause the four wins this year have been great. I think we can all agree on that is, you know, four wins is to win more than last year. You're halfway to the win more wins than you had last year, but overall the team, it's just frustrating to watch because drops by Keenan Allen were unacceptable. No targets to Cole come There's just not communication 
amongst the coaches. And I actually was talking to a former bear that's still in the NFL right now today. I was uh, texting him, you know, kind of, what are you feeling from the coaching staff? What are you feeling from, you know, what was it like when you were at the bears? He goes, all I'm going to say is it's a top down effort and the effort from the top, especially the criticism that he gives to his coordinators is not there. So kind of Eberflus players are pointing that Eberflus is the problem. And that's where I now I'm no longer on the Eberflus train. I, uh, before halftime, when they interviewed him real quick, or right after half, coming out of the half, and they're like, you know, would you tell the team? He's like, I told them what the score was. I told them we had each other. I just had a flashback to super bad where McLovin's in the hallway, and he's like, I told her what time it was. <laughs> <laughs> like, this is what it's we so have. I, I've watched like halftime schematic uh, type of interviews where Kevin O'Connell or Zach Taylor would be coming off the field and be like, yeah, we're, we're not protecting the ball on third down. We're, we're, uh, we're three for 11. And they just have these numbers off the top of their head. And he's just like, but we got each other guys. And it's, it's absolutely crazy that it, it reminds me of Matt Nagy and where the whys and all that kind of stuff. Um, just it's what coaches say when they have nothing schematic to provide or nothing that's statistical to provide. They start getting into your emotions and start talking about that nonsense. Um, two things that you were saying, Nick, like in the middle of that, like uh, Paulie mentioned this to me earlier as well. Justin Fields probably would be better on this team right now than Caleb Williams, just purely off the athletic ability and what kind of line that they're providing. Um, I'm not a big fan of Justin Fields over Caleb Williams at all, at all. And it's been consistent. We think that Caleb Williams is the future and he's that good. But right now, the way that they're running this team, yeah, probably Justin Fields would be a better fit for this team than what you're seeing out of Caleb Williams and what they're doing for him to help him scheme him up and get players open and get your tight end involved and have Keenan Allen stop running 15 yard out routes and stuff like that. Cause that's just never been his game and it's just not his game now. And I, I don't understand it. Um, and then yeah, secondly, the, the issue with fields also fell a little bit more on the contractual timeline. Like you'd have to pay him at some point. And, and I think that was oh, no, part we, of it. But if you just hone in on the one game, like if you just yeah, go, yeah. you know, one game. Yeah. I think fields is way more used to avoiding that kind of pressure. And you saw Caleb Williams running out there like a chicken with his head cut off. Yeah. Can I, can I comment real quick on the Justin Fields contract situation? Mm -hmm. I think that, we could have picked up his fifth year option, which would only been, you know, 14, I think it was 14.5 million, something like that. It was in that range. It was under, no, it was 16.5. I'm sorry. I would have rather have paid him. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy with Caleb Williams. He is the future. We've seen those flashes. It's just that you need an offensive line for your quarterback. And we went out and did nothing with that. Nate Davis, obviously a giant bust. Coleman Shelton was good four years ago. It pretty much you were better off keeping Cody Whitehair at that point, minus the contract situation, obviously. But Coleman Shelton, he's just, he's the worst. He's the worst center possible that we could have gotten. And also, where's Ryan Bates at this point? It's, he has arthritis, Nick. Leave he, him alone. He's an old man. <laughs> hey, let's, all right, Ryan Bates does? Oh, you didn't know that? That's, um, when this is the big criticism for me. Ryan Poles, uh, his shoulder and elbow issues are arthritic based meaning that they've been going on for a long time. And Ryan Poles Ryan knew Bates, that in his yeah. Ryan Bates knew that. So Ryan, no, Ryan Poles knew that. And Ryan Bates is issues knew the are, injury are arthritic. Yeah. So he knew off of the medical staff and he still went out and just traded draft capital for him. Um, isn't but it, you know, is, isn't it amazing though, that we said no to Larry Ogunjobi, who's doing very well in Pittsburgh now because of his injury status. And ever since then, Poles has just brought in these injury riddle guys, Karan Amagaji, Ryan Bates now, uh, yeah. also just, just come on, man. <laughs> there was like five or six pro bowl centers switching teams in the off season this year. And we just picked up none of them and we traded oh. draft capital for Ryan Bates instead. Also, you know, I was a big, um, big proponent of trade back in the draft, pick up a little bit more draft capital, probably go defensive end and get yourself a center in round two with that draft capital that you pick up. But you could so have Jackson powers. Johnson went 44th so for overall. me. It's like that Roma Dunze pick as much as I want to like Roman, as much as I understand that that's a pick for the future. It just still seemed like, wait a second, wide receiver three here. Like this isn't going to impact the football games this year as much as other moves could have that you could have made. And, um, yeah, I, I really didn't like it. And, I, you know, not to say that I don't like Rome. I do like Rome, but um, I just feel just from a team building standpoint, they could have done things differently to be able to address obvious holes. And I know there's this whole um, 
whole talk about, well, you take the best player available at a certain point. Sure. But I mean, when you have so many obvious holes, I think you need to get those fixed first and that could benefit you a lot more. So I just thought that the draft was mishandled at the end of the day, we have two offensive picks in the top 10. So like you expect to lean on an offense at some point, it's not happening. It's just not. Yeah. Uh, and then real quick before we, I, I do have two really great, I think good topic moving questions for Nick. Here's, I, I almost want to retitle this episode as the stench of McCaskey interference is returning. And, uh, and I, me and Polly had get to get into arguments about this maybe three to four times a year, Nick. And, um, I'm a big believer of ownership is top down. It is the thing that makes teams good or bad long term. Overall, um, Washington got rid of them. If you're, you know, you're a Cubs fan, or I don't know if you're a Sox or Cubs fan, but like when the um, Ricketts got a hold of the team and everything, whatever. I think the McCaskies, until they are gone or until they choose to sell, I think there's going to be similar, if not lingering, issues like this. It's very rare that this type of pathetic ownership. Um, ends up working and here's my experiment for you and just in terms of thought experiment you're talking about we you know Iberflus is a first year guy and we rarely do this stuff but the pattern and I said this to Polly as soon as Matt Iberflus got hired as soon as he got hired I said you know what he's gonna get fired in three to four years and you know what we're gonna do we're gonna get an offensive whiz kid genius because if you just look at the pattern George McCaskey is such a simpleton he is such a moron that he just goes like, well, we have Lovey and he's consistent, but he's boring. And so now I want to be like the hot offensive thing. So I'm going to get the hottest offensive guy from Canada and I'm going to get Mark Trestman. Oh, Mark Trestman made me look like a fool. So I'm going to get somebody consistent like Lovey, because at least with Lovey, we were consistent. And you go back to John Fox and add John Fox is too boring. And he's too paint by numbers and blah, blah, blah. And so you go to Matt Nagy, who's coaching. Patrick Mahomes and he's the hottest new thing and now Matt Nagy would blew up in my face so I want to redo the lovey thing again so I'm going to get a disciple of lovey and go with Matt Eberflus and I guarantee you we are going to hire either Ben Johnson if we are willing to pay the money which I don't believe because McCaskies will never shell out that type of money and or we're going to get like Lincoln Riley or we're going to get some fucking moron hot shot offensive coordinator who goes into the meeting room with George and George is just like, this guy makes me feel real smart. I'm going to hire this guy. And that's what you're going to see as the next step of this. And it's going to be just, just another year, recycle, rinse, repeat. Yeah. pattern has been there for years. I agree. I mean, I, I was very, I was excited about John Fox at first. And then I was like, wow, we have a bad roster and a, a good, this is when you see if a good coach is a good coach. He just didn't get it done. George McCaskey. I have select words from him because obviously I would like to work for the bears one day. And it doesn't seem like that guy's letting go of the team at any point. So I have to watch kind of what I say about him. Definitely. I will say, I will say this though, is that George McCaskey hiring a consultant and you hire your head coach before or your general manager the same day as the head coach and your general manager doesn't get to choose the head coach. That was a bit of a red flag and polls. If you listen to how he talks, about Eberflus. Eberflus is my guy. We trust him. This is that he doesn't go into detail about him. And sure, Flus is a great, great defensive minded guy, but you can't have someone like that. And if you're an owner and you're hiring a consultant to choose your team for you, when you're the one that's worth billions of dollars, where you are paying the paychecks, hundred million dollar payrolls, but you're making a billion dollars a year off that because the fans keep showing up because you know, you have a loyal fan base it's a definition of insanity. If you keep doing the same thing over and over again and it's not going to work, that's pure insanity. I think George McCaskey needs to, I mean, he has generational wealth for the next 15 generations, probably forever. Let's just say that. And I think that George McCaskey does need to let go of this team. I think he still does put his hand where it's not asked. And if it was Ryan Pohl's decision coming from Kansas City and learning what it's like to have a winning culture, Flus would have been canned last year. He did go on a hot streak at the end of the year. We almost made the playoffs. Great. Almost. Only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. Doesn't matter anymore. George McCaskey needs to let go of this team. He needs to stop. Give it to a group that actually wants to win. I like that you brought up the Ricketts because I feel like the Ricketts got their win and they did what the McCaskies did. 
And, and now they're like, oh, well, Cub fans are just going to show up no matter what every single time because look what happened with the team this year. I want, I want George McCaskey to get rid of this team because when I met him at training camp, really nice guy. With nice guys don't always win football games. I want an owner to come in, clear house, know that this is a good roster. As an owner, sit down with the players and be like, what are you guys looking for? And build this thing correctly. And I'm not saying get rid of Ryan Poles. I think Ryan Poles has done a great job minus the offensive line, which is kind of crazy considering he was an offensive lineman. He's got one more draft in him, kind of like Ryan Pace. And if he gets the next draft right, having four picks in the first three rounds and goes very heavy on offensive linemen, I think he saves this thing. But the, George McCaskey's got to go. He's the main problem. He's the he's the toxic person in this entire situation because it all starts at the top. And I believe once Virginia finally passes, which you know isn't anytime soon, it looks like she just keeps going and going and going. It's not going to change, unfortunately. But I do think new leadership needs to come in. See, and, and I mean, we've argued this back and forth, and I hate trying to defend the McCaskies in any way because they're not, they haven't earned it. They're not worth defending. But I do look at other organizations around the league. You know, Jim Mersey is not a good owner, but it's not, a, but when they had Peyton Manning, Bill Pullian was just fine. You know what I mean? And um, there's, we could go on and on about examples. And David gives me examples of the other way where, you know, once ownership does change, things change around. I just, I truly, I always try and focus GM down. And to me, it's, you know, it, it's sad because it only comes down to a few plays and a few things that need to be different, but those are the things that can change with a better head coach. You know, those decisions during a game can win you a couple games and whatnot. And when things are going good, I don't see anybody praising McCaskey or praising Virginia or anything like that. And and the fact of the matter is there are worse franchises out there that have had less success. I mean, we were in a Super Bowl in 2006. We were in an NFC championship in 2010. We you did make a little playoff run in 2018. It's not saying much. It really isn't. However, I'm just saying that when those moments arise, I don't hear the praise for the ownership. And so to me, I just cut that out of the picture. I tend to focus more of GM and head coach down. And I think as long as you get the head coach and the quarterback, right. Those two things, I think you could definitely have success despite ownership. And so, I mean, it's an, unfortunately an uphill battle, but I think it's not going to change her anytime soon. So that's what we're going to have to do. Me and Polly could do a whole hour episode about this literal debate. But I think, I think when you say it's GM down and it's coach down, I I don't think you hire the right GM or the right coach if your mentality isn't correct. And at this point, you go watch go watch the opening of Hard Knocks, just from this year. It's it's a two minute intro about forty years ago, and they they just can't get it out of their head that this is some sort of. Uh, legendary charter franchise with a rivalry to Green Bay. You you've lost the last ten straight games to Green Bay. This isn't a rivalry anymore. This is you are the bitch of the NFC North. And I'm sorry, like, and there's a few comments in here that we're not posting, but people saying like polls is polls endorsed Eberflus and this and that. I'm I can't prove it. I'll never be able to prove it, and I'm not gonna ask Nick to comment on it because if he's being a little bit more yeah, careful with his we're words. limited. No, 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 like, no, 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 guys, guys, I, I'm happy to comment on anything. But just, it's just, just it's, put that out there. <laughs> if, if you, first of all, it's just a known fact that Eberflus was hired before polls. It is a fact. It is not up for debate. It is a, it is cold, hard fact that Eberflus was hired. Then they hired polls like two or three days later. Then they reconfirmed with polls. And I'm sorry, go to a job interview for your dream job and say like, so we already hired your coach. What do you think about that, Ryan? Do you say no? What the fuck's the guy's going to say? Of course, he's going to say, like, no, great choice, George. It's it's the best choice that you could have ever seen. It's, it's amazing. And then, yes, he doubled down last year. So I will give people that argument. But even then, the McCaskies have never fired a head coach in the middle of the season ever. And it's not because of some honor system that they have. It's not because they're just the most – amazing sweet generous people and they've always want to give people a choice it, at the it's because they don't want to pay coaches that are not doing their job it is a notorious fact of the mccaskies 
David, I don't want to spend too much time on this because I know we are limited on time. Nick, if you just want to give us your response, yeah. and I kind of want to just move on to the game itself. No, no, no. I, I want to comment on this because it's Crimson, you dig, is saying it. Dennis Moody is saying it. I'm looking at the chat right now. And yeah. the Bears did this entire thing half-ass backwards. They did. Yeah. They hired their head coach first, then their GM, then their CEO. They should have hired their CEO because he would have had more say in the situation. Then you hire your GM because then he's going to be working well with Kevin Warren or whoever the CEO would have been. And then you hire your head coach. Cause I guarantee you that he would, that polls would have brought someone in from Kansas city, or he would have gone in a completely different direction versus uh, Matt Eberflus. And I wish that the bear and you know what polls and Eberflus did ha have the same agent. They have connections it doesn't mean that they're the same person on the same page because they coach two completely different teams. Look at the Chiefs. They built that offense for Patrick Mahomes. They built the line first. Then they brought in Mahomes. And sure, then you had a target in Tyreek Hill. You win three Super Bowls that way because now he has longevity and then they have a defense. I think that the Bears made the biggest mistake. Sure, you can, I, Dave, I'm agreeing with you. You know, the McCaskies would be the McCaskies. That's fine, but they should have hired a CEO first. That's That's my... Last comment on the subject. I know that, Paul, you want to move on to the game, but yeah, I, do. I think we should have done CEO first. At a very critical point in the game where um, we were still keeping it somewhat close, and then you have this uh, personal foul penalty yes. on Damn. Jervon Dexter for the leverage, and that turned a field goal into a touchdown and just seemed like we just couldn't overcome that. Do you guys think that that was the like turning point in the game for the players where it's just like, damn it, or where do you think at what point did this all go sour? So sour. I think it was the halftime run, the right before halftime uh, rushing touchdown. I really think it was. I that that point as fans, we're all like, well, um, Bears could have easily scored. They they could have been winning after halftime. That was my nail in the coffin. The lever the leveraging call. What are you going to do with Javon Dexter? He's six six three ten. He's going to be able to go over guys. Guys are going to chop block him. It's going to cause uh, leveraging calls. I I'm agreeing with you, Paul. That was a huge changing point. But that run took the life out of that team. And you, they panned over to Matt Eberflus. He looked defeated after that. It was that was that was it for me. I think the game was over when they stepped on the field. Um, that too. I, I texted Paulie Sunday morning, all Sunday morning, and Saturday and Friday, just talking about how I have called this team dead four or five times dead on arrival. And I was wrong every time. And most of the time when I thought something so egregious happened with the coaching and Eberflus fucking up that this team would quit on him and they never did. And for some reason, just in the back of my mind, I just said, this is different this time. For some reason, I feel like this is different. This has to be the, the straw that breaks the camel's back, but I just didn't have the balls to say it because they proved me wrong every time. And this time around with just, I think in retrospect, you could have really seen the way that the players were responding in the media and calling him out and talking about it. And I think there's something to be said about the lack of communication and how they respond to adversity, where most teams that call each other out, it's almost like on purpose, right? I'm going to call you out. You're going to call me out. We're all going to respond together. This was one of those pathetic, pathetic times where three days it was players calling people out players calling coaches out, then they're retracting these statements about how, well, you know, I, I do agree with what I said still, but I just went around it the wrong way. This is professional fucking football. It's a sport where guys bash each other's brains in. I don't give a shit about how you say it. Say the thing that needs to be said. And that's kind of where this uh, this week started, where I just thought it was the beginning of the end. I, was, I wish I was braver to say, you know, how obvious it was. Um, but it's just painfully obvious at this point. And, and I am 98% sure that Matt Eberflus will ride out till the end of the season. And I'm also 99.99% sure that it's the wrong choice. I think the best thing, the only logical thing to do, regardless of who takes over, because I'd rather watch the dumpster fire with Shane Waldron as the head coach, Eric, uh, Eric Washington as the interim head coach, anything would be better than this. And um, and I just know it's not going to happen because of the same reasons we just kind of went over in the last part. It was I think the game was over the moment they stepped on the field. 
I think this team is just done with it. Um, and it's only going to get worse from here because you can even tell in Eberflus's comments towards the end of the end of the week, leading up into the game, where now all of a sudden Eberflus is singing a different tune. Now everything is my fault. It only took you four years to realize that stop blaming your fucking players when you give them loafs and and <laughs> bl- you know what I mean. Like you're actually giving yeah. them fucking little tickets about it's like a it's like a kindergarten classroom. Like here's your ticket for fucking up. But I never, I never make the mistake. And then all of a sudden, everybody tells him, you're a fucking asshole. You fucked up, but you don't say it. And now all of a sudden on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, he's going, you know, I should have done that differently. Yeah, you should have been saying that four years ago, asshole. And not only four (laughs) years ago, you know, I told David, as a head coach coming into this, like, you've been in football your whole life, right? Whether you've played, whether you've been an assistant coach or whatever, you've experienced so much situational football that all these situations should not be too big for you. And yet it seems like when Matt Eberflus is in the moment, these situations are too big for him. It seems like he's getting lost. And then he's coming back with like, okay, well, we'll we'll have to take a look at that for me to give you – Uh, an answer honestly in this and that we're like i'll I'll tell you with like tyrick stevenson benching you have a guy like mike singletary and i'm not saying mike singletary achieved much as a head coach in this league right but uh, but i believe he was a real coach because after the vernon davis game he came out in the press conference and said i don't want him we can't win with him right away you go out there and and you make that statement it doesn't take you till wednesday or thursday to be like yeah okay I guess I hear what you're saying and this and that. And so to me, it's just, I think Eberflus is just incapable of having those moments, you know, not be too big for him. And uh, I, I, dude, I don't, uh, to me, it was damning during the Washington game where after Caleb brought the team back 26 seconds ago, he goes, sits on the bench, doesn't expect to play another down unless it goes into overtime. Finally, he's able to take a breath. What does he have to do? Get up and pull his coach off the field. (laughs) <laughs> When's the last time you've seen Andy Reid waddle onto the field? Like these guys are well aware of what their job is and what their duties are, and they don't get lost in the moment like that. And to me, that's really damning about Matt Eberflus. I, I agree that Matt Eberflus. So I know I'm, we're talking about the game now, and I, I just want to hit on a few things with the Arizona game. Is the Cardinals are a good team, no doubt about. It. They're a young team. They do have a young head coach. It's their, his first year, and the Cardinals have had the hardest schedule in football. The first you know, eight games. They were four and four through that time. They came in and showed, Hey, Arizona is a pretty decent ball club in their house too. So I gotta, you gotta give hats off to them. I'm not saying either that we should have dominated the Cardinals, but we should have won that game. The bears have a better defense. They have a better offensive roster, but they don't have a better offensive line. And we truly saw that against one of the worst pass rushes in football. So the Cardinals was not a cakewalk. And I knew walking into this game, everyone was like, Oh, we got this. We're going to win the next two games. And we're going to enter green Bay with the same record as them. I, I was like, I don't know. Like, obviously I'm going to say the bears are going to win every single time. You know, that graphic of Mike Ditka when it's all Packers chosen, he's the one choosing the bears. That's going to be me every single day and twice on Sunday. But this bears, I knew that this walking in this game, I was like, this is not going to be good. If, especially if the bears walk in overconfident, also missing Jaquan Brisker, Kyler Gordon, then you lot were missing Braxton Jones. You're missing your key players right there. Andrew Billings gets hurt. Now Darnell Wright has an MCL sprain. Just it's the Bears are in an ugly position right now. And with the game, I think they were underprepared. They did a great job holding Marvin Harrison, though. That was a big positive on the day. Only three catches. Not not a bad job there. But Kyler Murray was able to do whatever he wanted. They had the rush attack going. James Conner was running all over us. And you know, I gotta I gotta take a little shot here at my guy Javon Dexter. First four games, four sacks. He was doing a fantastic job. He's been non-existent since. That was the first time I heard his name on that leveraging call. Pen- and then the pre-snap penalties too, that killed this team. Chris Morgan as the offensive line coach didn't come in with a good plan. Shane Waldron just looked defeated. Him and Caleb sitting on the sideline like two kids at dinner with parents nowadays with two iPads not even talking to each other or looking at each other. Just not a good overall situation for the Bears in the Cardinals game. Cairo Santos, shout out to him for getting us our only points. Tory Taylor did a great job. Roma Dunze did a great job, but three guys doesn't win you a ball game. You know what I mean? And the game plan against Arizona was just horrendous for the Chicago well, bears, especially for Shane Waldron. And, and Nick, when I mentioned, 
Sorry, Real quick. When I mentioned moments that are too big for the head coach, uh, I think in this game you could point to the very end of the game where why would you still have Caleb Williams out there? I think any, any, anybody sitting on their couch, we don't pretend to be experts, but like this, that's obvious. How do you not put in Tyson Bajan out there? What would did you guys see though at halftime? Tyson Bajan had his helmet on, was stretching his legs and throwing. So they were like, you could go in at any moment. So maybe this Caleb injury was happening a little bit sooner. I don't think maybe people saw that, mm-hmm. but I was like, Watch Tyson Bajan, and during the stream, they zoomed in on Floos, and you see Bajan throw his helmet on, and then when they zoomed out on the kickoff, Bajan's jumping up and down, staying loose, getting ready to go. And when Caleb, Caleb usually jogs out on the field, he walked out on the field. I was, I honestly was like, okay, I think Tyson Bajan might be going in. Something's going on here. Caleb could have an injury we don't know about, and we finally saw it after getting sacked two times in the last two games. But, Paul, I could not agree more. Why is your number one overall pick when you're down 20 out there? You are not winning this game. Throw Tyson out there and see what he can do, even if you lose that game. My thing with that is, yes, um, it was sloppy. And at the end of the day, yes, there's lots of injuries. Braxton Jones, Kyler Gordon, all that stuff. But honestly, Nick, question, like with that performance, even with those injuries, you're not that bad of a team. I said to Pauly pre-show, who do you beat in the NFL with that type of preparedness and performance from last week or from yesterday? Like the Bears. I don't know if the Bears beat the Panthers. I don't know if the Bears beat the Saints. I don't know if the Bears beat the Giants or the Patriots with that level of performance last week. I don't think it's going to get much better moving up into the Patriots, but you're saying like, yes, the Cardinals are good and they're well coached. I agree with you. I think they're underrated. I think they're better. I think uh, Shane Steichen's pretty good, but that performance was so borderline sabotage, just borderline, not team, a team that did not care to be there. And to me, I, I can't name a team that the bears would have beaten on that, on that day. The, I'll go back to the Commanders game. The Commanders game, very similar game. If you look at the stats, you look how everyone played. The defense obviously played a a lot better, but you're playing an injured Jaden Daniels. You're playing a healthy Kyler Murray. Imagine if Jaden Daniels was healthy. I think that you honestly, would we would have gotten crushed by the Commanders at that point. I The Hail Mary obviously took a lot of life out of this team, and I think what the team needs to do is I would like to see a team, a players-only meeting talk about what you guys want out of your coaches and then go back to your coaches. You have these leadership committees on the defense, offense, and special teams. You go talk to Shane Waldron. You go talk to Eric Washington and Matty Eberflus and you talk to Richard Hightower and you'd be like, guys, this is what we're doing. I don't think special teams has anything to say, but you know, when Caleb comes out and says, you know, Tory Taylor, you're going to be kicking a lot less. That's not a good message because he's been kicking a ton, but he's been doing a great job. He grew, uh, anyone that says he wasn't worth the fourth round pick, I think is still crazy. No, but last week, I really think the only team that you would have beat in the NFL, maybe, maybe was, is the New England Patriots who we ironically play. Yeah. But, but it's, and we're not even favored by that much. And you know, I I think it's going to be bad. I think we're at a point now where I can't feel very comfortable about predicting any kind of a victory because I think we're more leaning on these teams beating themselves. You look at week one against the Titans, and that's a great example of a team beating themselves. You know, if Will Levis doesn't throw that pick six, we lose that game, right? So uh, I think Bill Parcells said it more. um, More games are lost in the NFL that are won which is a, f- a funny quote, but it's very true because I, it's so it sucks because my whole philosophy about football is I would love to dominate by design. I don't see the chiefs going into any week, hoping they're going to win. No, they're, they're expecting to win because yep. they're that damn good. And so that's what I want out of my football team. And I think we're at the exact opposite right now where we're just hoping these teams implode and we can maybe take advantage of it in order to sneak out a victory, which is not a good place to be. Going back into the off season and just talking about these coaches that um, were available. And I, I, Jim Harbaugh is the one that screams at me because I feel like that was the most realistic hire that the bears could have probably had. This offseason, I don't know how realistic it was just because Jim Harbaugh probably did want to go to California and 
have Justin Herbert and not have to deal with a rookie quarterback, but there is an identity. There is like two identities in LA with the chargers, a team that never had identity that never played a certain type of way. They run the fuck out of the ball. They're a top five defense. And Justin Herbert as a guy who used to throw 50 passes a game is now down to like 20 to 25. That's exactly what you're asking Caleb Williams to be and the type of team that you want him on. And there's just zero, and I mean zero, identity to this team. It used to be defense, and at this point, I wouldn't even say that. It's not running the ball. It's not Caleb Williams and shotguns and and spreading the ball out and things like that. But it, it's I don't know where to go from here, and that it's more conversation. But the identity part is is disgusting to me. I you know I was a big Dan Quinn fan. I really wanted Dan Quinn to come to Chicago experience head coach took a team to the Super Bowl did great in Dallas. I mean, look at Dallas now without him. Dallas is talk about no identity. Dallas is just a mess. You pay all those guys and they're just not even doing anything. I wanted Dan Quinn to um, come and hang, not hang out. He, I wanted him to coach the bears. I think he would have been a good choice because he has a defensive mind, but he also respects the offense and he brought in Cliff Kingsbury. You know what I mean? I think that Dan Quinn would have been the great choice for this team, especially if the bears wanted that defensive identity, but also keeping a guy that could with experience and has a ton of networking to bring in a top guy. Matt Eberflus can't establish and identify talent anywhere. It feels except a defensive perspective, but from a coaching perspective, Shane Waldron, you chose him over Cliff Kingsbury, the guy that was Caleb Williams, offensive coordinator. Come on. It was it was a no brainer, and Cliff Kingsbury wanted to come here. That's because, what I find most crazy because it creates a threat. And we talked about this during the off season where we said, "Hey, you get another guy in here. What you need is you need another guy on the offense that's pretty much a head coach in his own way, because you're not involved in the offense, right? You're you're defensive focused, so you're really trusting Shane Waldron to do a lot right now. But you could trust the guy that has more experience. But what does that do? That creates a threat. So in a situation like right now, Matt Eberflus is getting fired because you do have somebody that can replace him that's adequate in Cliff Kingsbury, whereas Shane Waldron isn't that. So now we're looking at it as like, okay, we're handicapped with this guy till the end of the year. And I think that that might have been part of – the uh, um, thought process behind that decision-making. But at the same time, you should not be threatened by your offensive coordinator taking your job if you're a damn good coach, right? Yeah, or if you're like, just objectivist to win. Right. Uh, Matt Eberflus is not an alpha. I, th I think we can, I think it sounds like that's kind of the message. The guy has no cojones. Like he has no confidence it, it, in himself. It, it's not so much that it's like, I don't even want to get into that. Cause there's, small, plenty of, like, so, there's plenty of like, so there's plenty of, there's plenty of like, under the radar type of coaches that don't really make a bunch of noise, but they at least feel comfortable in their decision-making or their, their schemes that they don't have to make a lot of noise. Lovey Smith and Tony Dungy. And I feel like those are guys from the past, but like Mike Tomlin doesn't do a lot of talking. He just does. He just acts yeah, Jim, Jim Harb, uh, John Harbaugh. I'm sorry. I always get him confused. John Harbaugh and the Ravens. He doesn't do a lot of talking. He just does. He's just a great manager. He's a great CEO type. And Matty Rifflews never demonstrated any of those skills, but yet he kind of got that opportunity to, to do it again. And we, we never really wanted him back to begin with, but it is what it is. Um, Dan Quinn was a guy that I considered during the off season as well, just with that coaching experience. He's a and you know, Super Bowl, he went up 28 to three, but there is something to be said with having an experienced guy come in here and having the staff underneath him. That's also experienced instead of trying this crapshoot thing where we're taking like Luke Getzey, who's never been an offensive coordinator and giving him an opportunity or we're taking... twice in the last 10 months, by the way. Right. <laughs> Nick, Nick yeah. I've asked this over and over, like who's got the worst coaching staff in the NFC North. And for the people that were not picking the bears, it's like, you understand we replaced both our coordinators. Anybody could have had Shane Waldron. If he's all that great. And yeah, you know what I mean? Him. Right. Right. I, I, I just, I don't understand what the bears obsession is like, we're going to find the next best great thing. No, go find the great thing and get it for your roster. You're the fourth biggest market, third biggest market in the NFL. And you know, I mean, 30, what was it? 39% of tickets for the Arizona game was bought by Illinois natives. 
I mean, your team just travels so well, and you have such a big fan base. Give them a winner. Don't give them an experiment. We're tired of experiments. We want something. We want something now. And you know, Bill Belichick's out there. I don't know if I would want him. Coaching choices, and what do you think the realistic next hire is? Because I think we both agree at this point, Matt Eberflus is out. Matt Eberflus is out. I mean. You never won a football game on a Sunday, which 90% of your games are played on games, Sunday. <laughs> Not, I'm sorry, road games, road, game, road games. Y you know, Flus does have that nine-game home winning streak. He changed the culture of winning in Chicago because Chicago was not winning a lot of ball games before he came to Chicago at home, which is where you should win. Not saying Matt Eberflus is going to stay because of that reason. You're going to go 500 every single year. Unless you get nine home games, then you'll be nine and eight. The Bears, The Bears need to find a way to bring in an experienced head coach with a proven record and win. A lot of people want Ben Johnson and Dave, you're like, we're not going to pay him. We're, there's no way he's going to want 15 million plus 20, 20 million yeah. plus. I mean, no doubt about it, but also you have a stacked and I mean stacked offense over in Detroit. And it only got better when David Montgomery went over there, missed that guy every single day. I, I I, if we bring in Ben Johnson, it's another experiment that makes me super nervous. And mm -hmm. Ben Johnson would have to bring all of Detroit's assistants with him for there to be a shot. Because Dan Campbell is a great head coach. He respects his coordinators, and his coordinators lead off of his example. If I were to go out and get a head coach right now from any team that's experienced, I mean, any or anyone with experience, I'm looking at Cliff Kingsbury because he has Ooh. coached in this league. He has won in this league. He went back to college. He learned a thing or two. He got the job done. Second guy I'm looking at is Brian Flores. Experienced Ooh. head coach. Got the job done in Miami. Obviously, the whole thing went down. Goes to Minnesota. You want a defensive winning head coach. Brian Flores is your guy. He knows the division. He understands the Vikings. He understands every single team that he's gone against. And he's proven that he can keep up with all of them. I mean, the Minnesota game with Detroit went down to the wire. The Green Bay game with Minnesota. Look what happened there. This guy leads by example. People are going to want to play for him. This defense is so young and good and under contract that if you bring in a guy like Brian Flores who shows emotion on the field, who gets fired up, who likes his players, that's a, Brian Flores is by far my number one right now if we go with experience. Then it's Cliff Kingsbury because he has a connection with Caleb Williams. Cliff Kingsbury is obviously having success. He knows how to get the job done. We're seeing that with Jane Daniels. We saw that with Kyler Murray. Those are my two guys. But if you go with the experiment, it's Ben Johnson. Um, my... It's funny because David last week said that Matt Eberflus is the sixth best head coach in the NFC North. He is. He is the sixth. I, Dave, I could not agree more with you. I really, I really agree with you there. Yeah. Um, my number one choice by a with a bullet is Kevin Stefanski. And then I want um, Ben Johnson as my experiment. And then defensive coordinators. I think there's just so many decent ones that you could probably pick up right now. If you could get Mike Vrabel and, or say, uh, even Robert, point. even Robert Sala as a defensive coordinator. Sala um, signed with the Packers, didn't he? He's no, a, he's a consultant. He's a consultant. Oh, okay. Vrabel's yeah. a consultant with Cleveland too. See how that worked gotcha. out. Um, <laughs> like, so I think my, my, my number one with a bullet is you get Kevin Stefanski as your uh, head coach and you, you bring along Mike Vrabel. They already have that connection in Cleveland. You bring in Mike Vrabel as a, as a defensive coordinator. I think that's a, the only issue I have with that is we go back to the McCaskey interference. I think that's too much uh, straightforward opinions and too many men. I, I don't know how to explain it other than a man's opinion. Uh, in front of George. So this is my second part. And then this is a two part question. I so feel like questions. Ryan Poles. Sorry. No, I love it. Ryan, it Poles, <laughs> Ryan Poles has, and I'm a fan. Don't get me wrong, but I, we put a video out probably what, like three months ago, four months ago, where I started, I started being dubious about the Ryan Poles era and minus the one trade. It's, you know, it's not been a great track record. What is the new timetable? Because that they keep kind of just pushing the buck or passing the buck and kind of pushing the timetable based on a new thing. 
I don't see the Washington Commanders doing a timetable. I don't see the Texans doing a timetable. We need an extra year or two of development or more draft picks or whatever. No, we're fucking winning now, and this is how we're going to do it. And then so that's my question is, what is the Bears' new timetable, in your opinion, after this year to keep his job and for – you know, what is our new timetable of success? Because what are we talking about here? Are we going to say next year we're hiring a new coach, instant success, which is what it should be in my opinion. And then the second one is people kept talking about Ryan Poles always, you know, not doing things because he doesn't want to get fired. Cause in my mind, every GM gets two coaches and two quarterbacks. That's just the, that's the basic timeline of a GM. If they're doing a half decent job, did Ryan Poles extend his life as a GM? by keeping Matt Eberflus or did he dig more of a grave? Because that was my opinion is if you had hired a coach last year and you had restarted that timetable for yourself by hiring a new coach, at least you could say you're, you're trying, you're doing something innovative. You're putting something out there. Did he shorten his timetable by keeping Eberflus? Cause in my mind he did. Now it's, it's instant. If the next guy doesn't work out, you're fucked. And then what is your new timetable? Okay, so here's what I'm going to do so I can say whatever I want. I'm going to put on my really big sunglasses so they can't identify me. So, man, we got we got the ski goggles on right now. So, in regards to your first question, the timetables, was that your first question? Or- yeah, yeah. It's like okay. a two-parter. It's like an all-in-one. So, Ryan Poles bought himself time by drafting Caleb Williams. I don't think keeping Matt Eberfuss does anything. You said, it, you said it best. You get two quarterbacks, you get two head coaches. Well, you got two quarterbacks now. Actually, really three, because you had Tyson Bajan in there at one point. But not by not by choice. Ryan Poles bought himself one more season. That's it. It's a win now moment. It's next year, it's win or you're gone. There, there's no doubt about it. You have to go out, you have to go and get offensive linemen. You have to protect your quarterback, your quarterback, your second quarterback. People need to look at the situation. And I guarantee you, Poles in his meetings was like, hey. This is what we're going to do. We're going to get every weapon possible for Caleb. We're going to do everything. We're going to get everything across the board so people can evaluate him. The league can watch, and we're going to see how Floos does. We're going to see how Shane does. If they, you know, shit the bed, they got one more chance, okay? So I think that the Bears, Ryan Poles has one more year in him in regards to winning and everything else. The, The commanders have done it. They have won right away by getting a new head coach. That example right there, number one versus number two quarterback, showed the McCaskies and showed Kevin Warren, you have one more chance. That's it. So I got Ryan Poles one more year because he gets one more head coach. Here's my issue, though, is that the Bears could then go and let's say they don't win. They bring in Brian Flores. They bring in Cliff Kingsbury, Ben Johnson, Vrabel, anybody along the lines that we've talked about, and they don't win, fire everybody. Literally clear house, start it new, because this roster is still an average of 25 and a half years old. It's a very young roster. It gets things done. They have so much untapped potential if they can stay healthy. That's another problem. There's so many factors that's keeping Ryan Poles here. Poles has done a good job. You know, the Nate Davis signing, that was a that was a that was not good. The Chase Claypool trade, that was not good. Poles was also a rookie GM. But you got to look at everything else that he's done. He's brought in Caleb Williams, Keenan Allen, DJ Moore, re-signed Cole Komet, brought in DeAndre Swift. Um, you go to the defensive side of the ball, Andrew Billings, Javon Dexter, Montez Sweat, you know, Jarrell Taylor. Tremaine There's Evans. enough good to point at for sure. There's way more. The, the good definitely outweighs the bad from a roster perspective. But we talked about this in the very beginning of the show, is that Poles did not have a say in this situation for the head coach. If it would have been his first head coach, and he got all this talent, and it's still in this situation, then maybe it would be this year. But I think he does have one more head coach in him. That's that's all I got for polls. I'm not losing faith in him, but if it if they crap the bet again next year, then it's time to can polls. Nick, I know you're limited on time. One of the things that we mentioned last week was, um, you know, uh, David said something along the lines of, you know, when you come when you go and face the Packers, like Matt LaFleur is stealing your lunch. And I brought up, (laughs) Hey, you know, that Matt Eberflus and Matt LaFleur got together at that basketball game during the off season. Go, you know, Eberflus was the one that bought those tickets. You know what I mean? Like he paid for all that. That's on him. And um, I mentioned that to one of my friends yesterday that was over at my house. And he's like, you think he sat next to him going, come on, man. 
give me one of your plays. Give me one of your plays. And, and Matt LaFleur was like, all right, try this no. one. Backup no. center, fullback dive. <laughs> yeah, and Matt LaFleur definitely was sitting sitting at home on his couch going, this idiot. Oh, <laughs> this little bitch. So.